It is 630. I do see that all of our board meeting members are on the um, meeting and want to welcome all who are joining us. Let us, um, as we are called to order, take a moment of silence. Thank you. I'm going to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Please join me. I pledge allegiance to the, flag, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. America. and to the Republic, the Republic for which it stands, stands. one nation, nation under, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, with liberty and, and justice for all. For all. Thank you. The next item is for approval of the agenda. Is there such a motion? I move to approve the agenda. Second. Been moved by Ms. Ope and seconded by Ms. Landers. I will go through the same process that I went through during our work session, asking each board member if they have comments or questions prior to the vote. Ms. Fisher, do you? No. Ms. Flanders? No. Ms. Griffith? No. Ms. Oak? No. Ms. Subramani, would you please call the roll? Yes. Ms. Fisher? Yes. Ms. Landers? Yes. Ms. Griffith? Yes. Ms. Oaf? Yes. Chairman Luter? Yes. Thank you. We move to the next item, which is recognition and awards. Mr. Manuel and I believe Ms. Stratton. Yes, I, I will take this one. The GMSD Teacher of the Year Committee was comprised of a school administrator, district office staff member, and the 2019-2020 GMSD Teachers of the Year. They met in January to review the Teacher of the Year applications from school level nominees. The committee used the following criteria to select this year's GMSD Teachers of the Year. They must have a broad understanding of research-based models for effective teaching and of current trends and issues in education. Be a facilitator of learning and skilled in implementing creative teaching strategies. Be able to show evidence of positive teacher effect over time related to student achievement through formal and informal documentation. Be able to explain, discuss, and defend a personal philosophy of teaching. Be poised, articulate, enthusiastic, and energetic. Be an exceptionally dedicated, knowledgeable, and skilled teacher. Have a superior ability to teach and to inspire in students a love of learning. Be recognized as leaders in the community as well as in the school. Show active involvement and leadership in professional development and extracurricular activities. Inspire students of all backgrounds and abilities to learn and have the respect and admiration of students, parents, and colleagues. The GMSD Teachers of the Year are, for pre-K through four, Juliet Williams from Dogwood Elementary, grades five through eight, Devin Pullman for Houston Middle School, and grades nine through 12, Catherine Jones from Houston High School. Uh, I am proud to say that they all exemplify all these characteristics and they are wonderful assets to our community. Uh, we can't wait to give them their awards, uh, uh, their plaques in person, uh, but we did call them when they were, uh, won their previous awards and thank them for all their service to our students. Uh, and with that, that concludes our GMSD Teachers of the Year and also our recognitions and awards. Ms. Luter. Thank you, Mr. Manuel. Our next item are our reports, beginning with our TLN update, Ms. Griffith. Thank you, Chairman Letter. So much has occurred since our last meeting. Longtime Senate Education Committee Chairwoman Dolores Gresham has announced that she will not seek reelection. The week of March 16th, the General Assembly passed a budget and legislation necessary for state operations. 
They then recessed with plans to reconvene on June 1st to discuss any remaining legislation and officially conclude. Prior to recessing, the General Assembly passed House Bill 2818 and Senate Bill 2672. This bill waives the following requirements. Those requirements were also recently listed in our work session, but I will uh, go over them um, briefly. TCAP testing, including TenReady and EOC, 180-day instructional days, ACT for 11th grade, and new civics, no taking of the new civics test required for graduation. TCAP scores will not be included in the student's final grade. Student growth from TCAP not included in teacher evaluations. Pre-K and kindergarten teachers not evaluated by student growth and performance. Teachers in non-tested grades and subjects are not to be evaluated using an alternate, alternate model. As a result of TCAP being waived, the student growth and performance data is not to be used to assign a letter grade to a school or identified as a priority school. Again, these are for this school year. Additionally, appropriations bill, House Bill 2821 and Senate Bill 2466 was also passed to offer accommodations for COVID-19 support. Although debated, the recent ESA program was still accounted for in this budget, whereas there were reductions noted of other education initiatives, such as teacher salary increases. We spoke to that uh, in our January meeting, I believe. GMSD legislative agenda update with some past legislation. One of our points was to amend student discipline laws and with House Bill 1671 and Senate Bill 1755, TCA Title 49 has been amended, which would give more discretion to director of schools to make determinations regarding alternative school placements in certain instances for suspension, excuse me, in grades seven through 12. Also a point, development, develop of formative assessment question bank. House Bill 1826 and Senate Bill 1946 requires the commissioner of the Department of Education to create a formative assessment question bank that aligns with state standards and make it available to all LEAs. The formation of this bank must begin by July 1 of this year. We are very excited about uh, both of those pieces moving forward. We will continue to watch pending legislation when the General Assembly reconvenes. Many bills of interest deal with teacher pay and accountability for ESA recipients. Other bills that we will continue to monitor closely are those um, about recall elections for school board members, House Bill 2139 and Senate Bill 2546, and also the Governor's Literacy Bill, House Bill 229, excuse me, 2229, and Senate Bill 2160, which we have discussed in great length at previous meetings. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Griffith. As the chairman, um, I get to give the chairman's report. And tonight I wanna to speak to you as both GMSD board chair and as a parent and express our ongoing concern for all of our students, our families and our staff. Together, we really are the GMSD family. And I know, and I have received phone calls and texts and emails with concern about when are we going to know something? What is going to happen? What is next? Um, that anxiety exists throughout our community and throughout our nation and throughout our world right now. And I want to help people feel comfortable that one of the things that was very important to us was not to give you one direction and then change direction as we hear more and more or heard more and more from our state board. Tonight, you're going to hear a lot about what we are doing as GMSD and what I want you to hear most is that we care. We care about every member of our GMSD family. And this is a time that is stressful, people are anxious, and we want our decisions and actions as a school system to be as helpful as possible and reduce rather than add to stress. Our teachers are meeting with students, they're sharing learning grids, they're calling them choice boards, um, we are listening in those Google Hangouts for anxieties and emotional concerns in addition to being concerned about our children's academics. We are offering options for learning for those children who are ready to go on and continue and for whom 
having opportunities to learn reduces stress without requiring it of students for whom having to continue to meet standards right now increases stress. We are as a district preparing for every potential educational environment for 2020-21. And I want families and our community to know that our staff is hard at work on that. This concludes the chairman's report. I turn it over now to Mr. Manuel for the superintendent's report. We are actually gonna go ahead and go with the financial reports first with Mr. Jones. Mr. Jones, if you will lead us through the financial reports. Sure, you have uh, the financial reports for the month ending March 31st, 2020. Uh, first on the balance sheet uh, in the school operating fund. Uh, if you look at the ending fund balance, that is our total reserves currently of 24.7 million. And the federal projects fund, uh, we are reporting a $225,000 receivable from the Tennessee Department of Education. Uh, for the remaining funds, uh, total assets, liabilities, and fund equity uh, total as follows. And the cafeteria fund, $275,000. Capital projects, $5.7 million. Uh, health insurance at $2.3 million. Uh, the OPEB Trust, 2.8 million, and the general fixed asset account group at 109.5 million. And that concludes the report on the balance sheet. Uh, Ms. Crowder, the next slide. A few comments uh, for some of our fund types in the school operating fund, uh, the target percentages for expenditures are administrative or support categories at 75%, instructional categories 67%. Uh, for total expenditures, we have spent 63% uh, of the total budget. With an expected and an unknown decrease in sales tax revenues, as a district, we have limited spending for all departments uh, based upon required needs. And that would include examples such as salaries, fringe benefits, textbooks, and maintenance and repairs uh, for the remainder of this fiscal year. In the Federal Projects Fund, we can continue spending in the Federal Projects Fund for title and IDEA programs uh, based upon information provided by the Tennessee Department of Education. Uh, the district will also be receiving 1.4 million and what is known as the CARES Act funding. Uh, it should be available to the district uh, beginning uh, sometime in May. Uh, this is additional federal funding for expenditures incurred to the district or by the district as a result of the coronavirus epidemic. And the cafeteria fund, uh, there are not any additional projected sales revenues or USDA reimbursements for the cafeteria operations uh, during the remainder of the school year. Uh, Airmark, uh, we've retained one uh, person, one administrative person uh, on board as part of our contract. All remaining uh, are all additional employees have been furloughed. Uh, any future administrative costs will either be absorbed by the school operating fund or be possibly reimbursed by the CARES Act funding. And finally, in the OPEP trust, uh, the net unrealized loss, realized losses uh, total 373,000 uh, for the month due to the impact of the coronavirus e epidemic on the market as well as rebalancing of our investments by U.S. Bank. And that concludes our financial report. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Mr. Manuel. Yes, for the superintendent's report, I, I think it's important to go back and, and highlight some of the successes that we've had um, during this challenging time, because uh, as you mentioned, Ms. Luter, so eloquently, uh, we have a lot of people who um, are in this occupation because they care about children. 
And not only are our families, see, families experiencing uh, struggles and challenges during this time, uh, but so are our, our teachers. Uh, and so they're balancing how are they working from home and our staff, how are they um, providing this, these online resources? How are they developing all these uh, activities while also uh, dealing with the impact of the epidemic themselves? So I just wanna thank them for all the work they've done and highlight what a lot of people in the district uh, have accomplished so far and what we plan to accomplish. So I'd like to go through a history of our COVID response. So uh, if, you, if you remember, um, March 13th through the 16th, right before we were uh, going out on spring break, uh, we announced that we would be closed through uh, March 27th. Uh, we made that decision uh, in, in response to try to protect um, our students and our families, even before uh, the governor and the commissioner of education had made that decision to start recommending school closures. We knew that this was gonna be something that we need to prepare for. At that time, uh, we were starting spring break, uh, but our academic team worked uh, diligently and, and worked a lot of hours to develop the GMSD at home resource website. And we were the first municipality to launch uh, this resource for our parents, because even though we were on uh, spring break, our parents were already asking for activities and opportunities for our students to learn and want to know what we were gonna do. We didn't wanna roll this out haphazardly. We wanted to prepare our staff, prepare our teachers, and prepare our parents for how we were going to move through this virtual and online world. So on March 19th, we launched Schoology, which is our uh, information system platform, our, um, our learning platform for our students. So in grades K through 12, and we've had it at the middle and high school level. <clears throat> we also expanded our AR and MyOn my for middle school so that students who couldn't get to libraries physically would have um, online resources and online textbooks so they could continue reading uh, for pleasure. And then the Tennessee Department of Education advised that local districts not to teach new material uh, on March 19th. That's when they were start, starting to become worried about equity. March 23rd, our staff and parents returned from spring break and our, our site, GMSD at Home, was shared with families and they could start using those resources. Uh, we also started training parents on uh, Schoology, that communication system, Google Hangouts, and we also started sharing the expectations uh, for our distance learning opportunities. Staff was also working diligently to compile lists of students that didn't have access to technology and those who need to pick up essential items like medicines at the school. So the school level administration worked out plans for parents and families to get in and pick up those items. March 27th, learning opportunities and live sessions with teachers began across the district. Students with IEPs were con contacted and our exceptional student department uh, was working diligently to make sure that we weren't losing any students and making sure that we were serving their needs. Uh, we also started uh, deploying devices to elementary students who didn't have them at home. And for those families that didn't have um, internet access, we made sure that they had physical copies of learning packets. And so uh, we have been delivering those to families uh, without internet service. Then on April 9th, the Tennessee State School Board changed their policies, uh, prohibiting attendance for accountability purposes. Uh, all untaught standards were also compiled through the district because we know that we have to have a plan to help those students uh, finish what we have started this year. And we have a quarter three recovery plan uh, that we created. Uh, per the state school board guidance, we want to provide an opportunity for students to improve their third quarter grade since they wouldn't have a chance to improve their fourth quarter. And then on April 15th, uh, the Tennessee governor recommended the closure of all schools through the remainder of the year. And so what does this look like? Uh, and what are some exemplars and examples of this? Ms. Price is gonna help us uh, go through some of these uh, real physical examples of what it looks like. Ms. Price? So for us, <clears throat> it needed to be very flexible and we knew we didn't want our students to just be online. We didn't want to add to more screen time. So um, a couple of the teachers and PLCs came up with choice boards so that we could offer all kinds of different activities from academics to art to music to just some fun things to do at home. Um, our administrators were taken through training on Schoology while the teachers were being trained so that they could begin monitoring their Schoology pages. Teachers are creating lessons, they're scheduling Google Hangouts and um, establishing ways for students and parents to ask questions. So all, all of our schools are engaged, um, even our teachers that are in non-tested areas such as our 
teachers of PE and music. You've seen some of those wonderful um, activities on Twitter and other, other spaces. So here I, we have two examples of what Schoology looks like from a student's perspective. On the left side of your screen, that shows what it looks like when you get into the actual materials. And so in, in, in those folders will be different activities for students to take part in throughout the week. Um, and everybody's done theirs a little bit differently, but most of them um, are either GMSD at home or they say COVID or something along those lines as far as the folders. Then if you go over to the right side of the page, this is where you can find the updates. And this is where teachers um, will put messages out for their students. And as you can see, this one has some Google Hangouts. There's also a calendar that's not in the screenshot where a student can pull up the calendar for a week and see um, what's coming for the whole week. All of our teachers aren't um, completely trained. So I'll say sixth through 12th grade uh, is, is on top of this. They've already been doing it for more than a year. Our elementary are coming along very quickly. So here's what an, a choice board today looks like. I, wanna, I do wanna say that um, over time, they've become more and more robust. And I think our teachers are enjoying the um, license to be creative and they're getting the hang of it. So here's one that you need to choose five squares daily. This is for sixth grade. And this was for uh, last week. So as you can see, it covers all of the major areas plus a physical activity and some art. Here is what our elementary Schoology pages are going to look like. Ms. Pettit is dug in and she has uh, attended lots of trainings and she's really, really taken her page to another level. She's not the only teacher, but this does take a lot of training to go through and add each of the pieces. So again, on the left side of your screen, you'll see her materials and she's done hers by the week. So you would open those folders and then each of those folders will be optional learning opportunities. And then on the right side is where she has her updates. And that's where she just tells her students maybe about a, a Google Hangout Meetup or any other updates that she needs to. So I'm so proud um, of, our, of our elementary school teachers for digging in and, and I can't thank Chris Cooper enough for making these trainings happen as well as um, the CTTs being in those meeting and answering questions. So onward, we go to a, a example of an elementary school choice board. Um, and you can see here, this one's just set up a little bit differently, but with the same intent. So you have um, all of the choices on one side, you have some other um, opportunities and links on the other side. So um, learning opportunities, and that is for this current week. And that's at the elementary fourth grade level. And then the high school. The high school is business as usual. Um, they have been using Schoology all year long. This is how they communicate with their students. They put homework on here. Um, different kinds of study guides for tests. Um, students turn in work on Schoology at the high school level. So here you can see an Algebra 1 hon honors class um, where the updates are there on the left. And this teacher chose to just put them right into a PDF right on the updates so the student didn't have to go to materials. And the student pulls that up, prints that out, they'll complete it and scan it back to the teacher. Ms. Harris, talk about pre-K. Hoffman. Thank you, Ms. Price. And so, yes, when we're talking about pre-K, this is just one of the examples from our preschool teachers. And as a reminder, we have preschool classrooms that serve not only our students with disabilities as well as typical peers. So we look at how can we um, ensure that all students have access to activities. And so you can see, I love her rainbow colors and it looks very preschool when you look at her Schoology page. But in addition to what Ms. Greer does, they post, I don't know if you kind of see in the picture, um, videos of them reading books or circle times. Um, you'll see a little bit of uh, 
difference too and what some of the other preschool teachers are doing in the video that's coming up. But just wanted to share that, you know, in addition to what Ms. Price was discussing, you know, our special ed teachers are differentiating those choice boards, attending hangouts with the general ed teachers, and then holding separate hangouts and providing additional resources in their Schoology um, schedule to make sure that our students with disabilities are receiving um, their accommodations and um, getting what they need during this time, whether it be academically or social emotionally. Uh, so I, with that, I kind of think that my teachers and, and therapists uh, they're doing great things through telesupport, can really give you a better picture with this video than I can in explaining it. So with that, Kate, I will let you play the video. Ms. Crowder, we're in we will, here. Yes, we're going to pause uh, with the video, uh, but if Ms. Huffman, if you just want to sum up uh, the video and your team and your efforts around what we're doing for our students, and then we will move to the next thing. Ms. Huffman, go ahead. Sure. So this video just highlights what the um, preschool teachers as well as therapists, we tried to grab someone from, from each school um, to kind of just give an overview of what do learning opportunities look like within the home environment, some additional connections that they've been able to make. Um, examples, we have our gifted teacher who also was one of our teachers of the year right there, Miss Williams, just give, um, you know, just kind of background of the activities that are available. Um, it was just a really neat opportunity to see how everyone has adjusted to the new environment. So we're all still working very hard, just in different ways. And that's an example that she's showing now of some videos that Houston Middle created. We're still trying to work on those transitional skills that are a part of students' IEPs in the home environment. And so there are things that they can watch over and over, whether it's um, making a grilled cheese or gardening or cleaning up. Um, and then I think last Miss Minton just does a great job at giving just one example of how she's differentiating for the students that she serves um, at the high school in uh, biology AB. So with that, I think I gave a good summary, not as well as what they would have, but um, that's, that's kind of a, a summary of it. So thank you. So with all of that being said, um, our learning opportunities by the numbers. We, um, as of last week, have held 7,271 meetings across the district. Um, the average meeting length is 30 minutes. I can promise you that Ms. Huffman, myself, Mr. Bland, and the rest of us, our meetings are probably quite a bit longer, but um, our teachers and PLCs and administrative staff are all having meetings, and they're including our our non-classified staff as well. Um, and that, that equates to over 5,000 hours and we've had over 38,000 people participate in Google Hangouts. And then in our Schoology sessions, we've had 74,000 total sessions. We have 2,166 active parents and 7,700 activities have been submitted. So our teachers are working hard. I can't um, express to you how excited I am and how I see things getting better and better and better and more creative and um, by the day, by the week. And um, I think we've done um, everything we can to make sure that all students needs are met and that we are providing opportunities for our students to continue learning. So for social emotional resources, uh, this was a effort between the district social workers and the school counselors to compile a list of resources for students and parents 
the resources range from how and where to go for mental health referrals to how parents can file for unemployment to where to find local food pantries for those that need it. Uh, we just wanted to make sure that the parents, we provided parents with a wealth of resources uh, to help them during this time. And those uh, resources are updated as things change. And those resources can be found on the GMSD at home uh, page that TLA created. I think it's also uh, important to show how, how people have, have worked hard to serve those families that don't have uh, the same access uh, to technology that, that other families do. Uh, we've had a multi-tier approach. Uh, Officer Crump, uh, Wes Crump, uh, Mr. Manuel works for the television studio, Mr. Bland and his son. Uh, I know that Ms. Price and uh, her assistant, Ms. Rosie, they've been doing incredible things to, to prepare for whether it was the hard packets uh, for families that didn't have internet access or delivering uh, laptops and iPads to families that didn't have enough or didn't have devices for their students to access these online activities. Um, we were trying to reach all families and students, and we were uh, a delivery service uh, over the past few weeks to really make sure that uh, no one is getting left behind uh, and everyone was taken care of during this period of time. So we want to thank everyone who really stepped up and helped del deliver all those devices and materials and prepare them uh, for our families. What began as a conversation with one of our community partnership focus groups um, a little over a month ago has quickly evolved in the current situation um, as a weekly parent development series. So our first virtual session covering the basics of Schoology was able to draw in over 500 parents, which is incredible. This series is going to continue and can be followed by community members at the GMSD at home website. Uh, the leadership in GMSD are also working in tandem with parent leaders and keeping a really good open line of communication. Um, we want to support our very supportive parent teacher organizations throughout this crisis as well. GMSD is also committed to providing learning options that extend beyond the computer screen. To date, over 38 teacher lessons are currently streaming on Comcast Channel 17 and UVerse Channel 99. A full listing of these opportunities can be found at our website at www.gmsdk12.org under our Germantown Municipal Television tab. Now, these lessons range from early literacy, like the phonics lesson that you see here in the left-hand corner, or a social studies lesson with Riverdale's Mr. Frizzell, who's hosting class from his front lawn. A group of third through fifth grade teachers across schools have assembled, and they are organizing a series of lessons on fractions that release each week, which I'm finding both helpful for students and for parents. Uh, meanwhile, over at Houston Middle School, Mr. Murray is quite the personality and has been hosting a historical talk show in his living room each week. Of course, Ms. Minton from Houston High School is seen here teaching in her bathtub. Um, we are proud to work with these teachers, the television staff and myself, as they showcase their best lessons in these extremely unique ways. And we really do look forward to airing all the things that they come up with next. And last but not least, what I, I think is also special, if you look around social media and, and you look at all the opportunities that are uh, being provided and posted at each of our schools, I think it truly shows that even during this uh, time where our staff are challenged, they are reaching out to meet those uh, social emotional needs of our students uh, because we all uh, got in this business because we care about children. So whether it's through parades or the use of puppets or, or music activities where we're making songs together, uh, we are showing our families and our students that we are a family and that we care about them. Uh, so hopefully uh, our families will see this uh, explode and uh, see lots of numerous ways where uh, our staff are really going above and beyond to show that we care about them. And with that, uh, Ms. Luter, I will uh, turn it back over to you. Thank you, Mr. Manuel, and Ms. Price, and Ms. Huffman, and Mr. Bland. I think I got everybody. 
We move to the next item on our agenda, which is the consent agenda. Tonight in the consent agenda is the approval of minutes for four of our meetings and the annual review revision of policies second reading. Um, the chair would entertain a motion to accept the consent agenda. Chairman, I'm sorry. I to approve all the items in the consent agenda. I second. Been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion, Ms. Fisher? None, thank you. Ms. Landers? No, thank you. Ms. Griffith? No, thank you. Ms. Oates? No, thank you. Ms. Subramani, would you please call the roll? Yeah. Ms. Landers? Yes. Ms. Griffith? Yes. Ms. Oath? Yes. Ms. Fisher? Yes. Chairman Luther? Yes. Thank you. We move to board action items number 8A, approval of grant of tenure to the recommendation to the recommended teachers. And I turn that over to Mr. Emanuel to speak. Yes. I also think it may be helpful now that we are actually moving into our agenda items to um, discuss why we are having a virtual meeting and that uh, per the, the changes in the state law, we are allowed to have a virtual meeting in light of the, the COVID uh, epidemic that we are experiencing right now. So before we move on with our policies, that, that I would like to state for the record that that is why we are having this virtual meeting at this time. So with that, I will turn it over to Ms. Stratton uh, to lead us through the, the tenure process that our, our teachers have achieved. Okay, thanks Mr. Manuel. So just to give everybody a, a little bit of background information on what the definition of tenure is, simply put, tenure is an employment status and all teachers in GMSD are considered either probationary or tenured. Tenure provides due process for teachers during discipline or dismissal cases and in addition, tenured teachers have continuing employment with GMSD unless they're being dismissed for cause. So while Tennessee state law outlines the tenure eligibility requirements, the granting of tenure is a local board of education decision. The GMSD teachers we're recommending tonight for tenure consideration have served the required probationary status of working in a Tennessee public school for at least five years and have proven continued success as a classroom teacher by earning level of effectiveness scores of either above expectations or significantly above expectations within their last two years of teaching on a probationary status, which ended at the conclusion of the 1819 school year. These level of effectiveness scores are determined through classroom and professionalism evaluations, as well as student achievement and growth data. The Germantown Municipal School District Human Resources Department, along with the support of Superintendent Manuel and all six of our school principals are excited to recommend to you the names of 31 teachers who are eligible for tenure within our district. We are hopeful to celebrate with these teachers and their tenure accomplishments at a later date when we're all able to be together in person. At this time, Chairman Luter, I'm happy to answer any questions you or other members of the school board may have regarding the tenure process. Thank you, Ms. Stratton. Are there any questions, Ms. Fisher? I have none at this time, thank you. Ms. Landers? None, thank you. Ms. Griffith? No questions at this time. Ms. Oath? No questions, thank you. Is there a motion? I move, to, I move to approve the grant of tenure to the recommended GMSD teachers after first and final reading. Second. To second that, that motion as well. Is there any discussion, Ms. Fisher? No, not at this time, thank you. Ms. Landers? None, thank you. Ms. Griffith? No, thank you. Ms. Oath? I just wanna extend my congratulations to these excellent teachers. I know it was hard work to get where you are right now. And we are proud of um, the hard work you've put in and the fact that you are our teachers and part of the GMSD family. Thank you, Ms. Oath. I want to second that and say we do look forward to celebrating with you um, as soon as we are able. Ms. Okay. Ramani, please 
I'm sorry. I just was reiterating that I cannot wait to celebrate with them. Ms. Subramani, would you please call the roll? Yes. Ms. Griffin? Yes. Ms. Ove? Yes. Ms. Fisher? Ms. Fisher? Yes. Ms. Landers? Yes. Chairman Luther? Yes. Thank you. So ordered. We move to item 8B, approval of policy HR 5.3051 FFCRA leave. Um, Ms. Stratton, are you speaking to that? Yes, I am. Yes, and, uh, I'll, also, and I'll also kick her off. Um, so as you're aware, uh, the state um, legislature has passed and federal government have passed new policies and laws that, that govern us. Um, this policy, the FFCRA, uh, is similar to what people may know as the FMLA policy and has modifications in light of our current pandemic. So, Ms. Stratton, you can take over the description of the FFCRA policy. Sounds great. Thank you. Um, so the provisions in the, the policy uh, both apply to full-time and part-time GMSD employees. And in regards to the emergency paid sick leave, there are six reasons that are specifically related to COVID-19 where an employee may be able to receive two weeks worth of paid sick leave if they're unable to work or telework. Um, just a summary of the reasons, um, they center around being quarantined or experiencing COVID-19 symptoms or taking care of a family member who is quarantined or sick with COVID-19 or being unable to work because the employee has to care for a child whose daycare or school is closed due to COVID-19. In regards to the expanded FMLA leave portion of this policy, the FFCRA leave um, also expands FMLA leave to allow for employees who are unable to work or telework to take up to a total of 12 weeks of leave to care for a child because of a school daycare or facility closure specifically relating to COVID-19. The first 10 days of this leave are to be unpaid unless the employee chooses to take any existing leave. And after the initial two weeks, the remaining 10 weeks of expanded FMLA are to be taking at two thirds of the employee's daily rate of pay up to $200 per day. Or the employee can choose to utilize his or her own accrued sick time. Uh, the GMSD Human Resources Department is going to work with our employees on a case by case basis to complete a fact analysis to determine eligibility for leave and specific pay amounts. Um, it's important to note that the FFCRA leave is set to expire on December 31st, 2020, which is one of the reasons why we want to have a standalone policy rather than just amending our current FMLA policy. At this time, Chairman Luter, I'm happy to answer any questions you or other members of the school board may have regarding GMSD HR policy 5.3051 FFCRA leave. Thank you, Ms. Stratton. Is there a motion? I move to approve policy HR 5.3051 FFCRA leave after first and final reading. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Ms. Fisher, do you have any discussion or questions? No, not at this time, thank you. Ms. Landers? None, thank you. Ms. Griffith? No questions at this time. Thank you, Ms. Stratton. And I do agree with the um, having a separate policy as opposed to amending. I really appreciate that measure as well. Ms. O. No, not at this time. Thank you, Ms. Stratton. Thank you, Ms. Subramani. Will you please call the roll? Yes, I have a clarification. I would like to know who made the second. I saw Ms. Landers and Ms. O seconded. So I think Ms. Landers made the second. Okay, thank you. Starting the roll call, Ms. Ov? Yes. Ms. Fisher? Yes. Ms. Landers? Yes. Ms. Griffith? Yes. Charmel Luter? Yes. Thank you. We move to the next item on our agenda. 
which is item 8C, approval of external staffing of substitute workforce contract. Um, Mr. Manuel. As the board is aware, uh, we have used Kelly Services to uh, outsource uh, the recruitment and also the hiring of substitutes for our district uh, since the district was formed. Uh, we are concluding uh, our first term of contract with Kelly Services and thought it would be wise to put this out to bid. Um, so with that, I'll let Ms. Stratton describe uh, how we selected uh, Kelly Services for uh, moving forward. Ms. Stratton. Thanks, Mr. Manuel. Um, so in March of 2020, GMSD did issue a request for proposal for the external staffing, and we received two responses from companies. Uh, one company was called Employer Support Services, or we all know that company as ESS, and the other company was Kelly Services Incorporated. Um, an evaluation committee was assembled to review both RFPs and the committee looked at areas such as recruitment, training, staffing, software, and pricing. And both companies were very similar or even identical when it came to the areas of recruitment, training, software, and pricing. But what stood out to the evaluation committee was the number of staff members that were specifically assigned to support the substitutes in our schools. So ESS is willing to dedicate one staff member for GMSD to handle all of the recruitment, onboarding, training, and discipline. And Kelly Services has a total of three staff members supporting GMSD in these areas. The committee's really excited about the addition of a Kelly Services position called a substitute mentor. They're allowing GMSD to recommend a retired GMSD teacher or administrator to serve in this role. And this mentor will visit substitutes weekly in their classrooms to monitor and provide helpful advice on their performance. And we feel by having a former GMSD employee as a substitute mentor that this person can assist the substitutes in maintaining the high levels of expectations for teaching as well as utilize additional instructional supports that GMSD has to offer. Just some other factors that the evaluation committee deemed favorable towards Kelly Services include the positive relationship GMSD has already established with Kelly's as a vendor. Our substitutes would not have to reapply with a different company over the summer. And looking towards the future, Kelly Services could also fill non-instructional positions such as custodial, clerical, food service, school counselors, speech and language pathologists, and occupational and physical therapists. So at this time, Chairman Luter, I'm, I'm more than happy to answer any questions you or other members of the school board may have in regard to the recommendation to award the GMSD substitute vendor contract to Kelly Services. Thank you, Ms. Stratton. Um, I will um, accept a, a motion from the board. I move to approve the awarding of the external staffing of substitute workforce contract to Kelly Services Incorporated. Is there a second? A second. It was moved by Ms. Oath and seconded, I believe, by Ms. Griffith. Correct. Is there discussion? Ms. Fisher? Um, I just want to add that I think the idea of a substitute mentor position is um, an excellent addition to um, the Kelly services. Ms. Flanders? None, thank you. Ms. Griffith? None at this time, thank you. Ms. Oath? None, thank you. Thank you. Um, we all are excited about the mentor position as we expressed in the work session. Um, thank you, Ms. Fisher, for for reminding us all of that. Um, Ms. Subramani, would you please call the roll? Yes. Ms. Fisher? Yes. Ms. Landers? Yes. Ms. Griffith? Yes. Ms. Ove? Yes. Chairman Luter? Yes. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is item 8D, Amended School Activity Fund Audit Contract 2019-20. Mr. Manuel. As the board is aware, this is a requirement. Uh, it's in our policy and it's also in statute that we audit uh, our schools and also district accounts. Uh, 
And so this is an amendment to our current uh, contract with an auditing firm. Mr. Jones, if you would describe the amendment, please. Sure. Uh, we have amended the contract uh, with Watkins Uberall as our external auditors to incorporate the addition of Forest Hill Elementary School into the audit process. And the total fee now is $20,400. If there are any questions, uh, Chairman Luter or board members, uh, please let me know. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Um, is there a motion? I move. Well, that's the wrong one, so that's not going to work. I move to approve the amended school activity fund audit contract for 2019-20. Second. Was moved by Ms. Griffith. I believe it was seconded by Ms. Fisher. Is there discussion? Ms. Fisher? No, thank you. Ms. Landers? No, thank you. Ms. Griffith? None, thank you. Ms. Oath? None, thank you. Ms. Subramani, would you please call the roll? Ms. Landers? Yes. Ms. Griffith? Yes. Ms. Sof? Yes. Ms. Fisher? Yes. Chairman Yes. Luther? Thank you. The next items on our agenda have to do with bid proposals. Um, first, we're going to go for a um, overview of our fiscal year 20 and how COVID-19 will affect it. Mr. Manuel? Yes, I think it's important for our board uh, to move carefully um, as we are approving future projects uh, in light of our current, the current pandemic and the impact that's going to have on our revenue stream. So I'd like to take a moment to talk about uh, our financial background. Uh, this document should look familiar. It is from our budget document, which is online on our website. Uh, but you can see when we talk about uh, county taxes, which are really 40%, almost 41% of our revenue stream. Uh, there is one particular line item that is a concern for us as a school district. If you look at the uh, local option sales tax for the 2020 fiscal year budget, uh, we were sitting at 6.8 million uh, for that revenue stream. And we know that uh, we are seeing dramatic decreases in revenue streams uh, in our local municipality and across the state. I've heard anywhere numbers from 60% reductions to 40% reductions in local options uh, sales tax. And so for us, this will be a concern um, because this is one of our uh, revenue streams and we may see a dramatic reduction uh, going forward. So as we are making decisions about our capital improvements, we need to be concerned about uh, and, and wait and see how quickly the economy is gonna recover and, and what is our sales tax revenue gonna look like during the next fiscal year. We also have uh, an increased uh, expense that we need to prepare for. Uh, since the creation of the district, the German, city of Germantown has been paying an annual payment to Shelby County Schools. It was a settlement agreement. Uh, we agreed uh, to pay as a district. Our school board agreed to pay for OPEB contributions for Shelby County Schools for the employees that had retired uh, from our area with them. And in exchange, we were granted the five uh, municipal buildings uh, that we started with and properties. Uh, that amount of money will have to be paid for out of our general fund, and so that'll be another reduction besides the sales tax uh, revenue that we're expecting. Uh, so the Germantown School Board uh, did agree to pay $355,000 uh, a year to Shelby County Schools that has already been paid uh, for these first six years, and we're thankful to the city for uh, paying that for us. But in light of the changes in sales tax, they have asked our board to take back over this responsibility and pay for it for the next uh, six years. So let's look at the projects that we want to discuss tonight in light of what is going to happen and, and how we are going to face some economic challenges as a district. So we have received to date 2.8 million from the Shelby County Commission. That has to be specifically used on capital improvement projects. And I do want to highlight that painting does not count as a capital improvement project for 
uh, Shelby County's audit purposes. Um, so we do have to spend that money. That money has been received and we do need to spend that uh, before uh, next September. So we need to make plans to spend that money. We also have some remaining money to receive from them that we are expecting to receive capital improvement money of $623,000 from the Shelby County Commission that also needs to be spent on capital improvement projects. We're also thankful to the city of Germantown because the last year during their budget process, they budgeted for Dogwood Elementary School to receive a secure entrance and they agreed to pay 500,000. So they will be giving us revenue uh, for that purpose. And then we do have uh, money in our general fund of 676,000 uh, capital improvement dollars. And so it's a total of uh, four almost 4.6 million uh, in those funds. We do have more money in the general fund. I will talk about that, that we moved specifically over for Houston Middle Schools project. Uh, I'm not including uh, that $3 million in the, in the funding here. When you look at the projects we want to approve, um, Dogwood's ADA project, we put that out to bid and the lowest and best bidder uh, came back in at 3.7 uh, million. Uh, as you saw, we do have the revenue that we received from Shelby County uh, Commission and from the city of Germantown for those projects. And so our recommendation tonight is to go ahead and complete that project uh, at this cost. We also have a Riverdale painting project, uh, like I mentioned, that cannot be classified for Shelby County dollars, but we do have that money budgeted and planned for in our uh, uh, operations account, our capital improvement account. Uh, this project will cost 328,000. So the total of these two projects is just over $4 million. And that will be our recommendation uh, to proceed with these two projects, like I said, because we've received these and also because they're uh, needed projects uh, at Riverdale, that, that painting is in dire need. What we are um, asking to, to hold on and, and what we have to hold on uh, because of the dramatic changes that we're gonna see in revenue, the city of Germantown has said that they are not going to bond for the $5 million that they'd originally planned for the Houston Middle School Addition Project. We cannot pay for that addition fully out of our um, operating account. So this is something that we will need to postpone or hold until we see what's gonna happen with our revenue stream. So because the board had previously moved $3 million from our reserve uh, into our operations account at the end of this year, we will let that roll back into reserves so that we can save that when we're ready to complete the Houston Middle School addition. We had also bid on bathroom renovations and completing the bathroom renovations at uh, all of our schools. Uh, at this time, uh, we want to, uh, it is our recommendation to postpone those bathroom renovation projects because we do not know um, how our revenue is gonna proceed. And, and we know that we're gonna be looking at a situation where we are going to be tapping into our reserve potentially for uh, our general operating accounts, but also it may be uh, for a huge middle school addition. We may choose to postpone other projects and put that one in higher priority. So with that, we will move to the individual projects themselves and I'll have uh, Mr. Kathy present on each item individually and we'll discuss each item individually um, because they are separate items uh, on the agenda. So Mr. Kathy, at this time, would you explain the bid process uh, for the Riverdale painting project? Yes, sir. For the Riverdale painting bid, uh, we broke this out into three separate sections of the bid. Uh, the base bid section is to paint building B, which is the main building and building C, which is the kindergarten building. Uh, including all the interior and exterior paintable surfaces. Uh, then there was an add alternate one. Um, that's a price in addition to the base bid to elect electrostatically paint all exterior metal and plastic surfaces. It's important to note that an add alternate provides an amount above and beyond the base bid to perform the work. However, it's not an alternate price to complete the work independently. There are amounts included in the base bid to complete this work without using the electrostatic painting process. The amount included in add alternate number one is the price in addition to the base bid for which the contractor will complete the electrostatic painting process. Electro electrostatic painting is a process achieved by positively charging the atomized paint particles as they are applied so the paint attracts the negatively charged piece or surface being painted. In short, the opposites attract to one another. The advantages of this process include increased or improved quality, better bonding, aesthetics, and the longevity of the job. 
The electrostatic painting process is something we are recommending in this case, given the price we received. Add alternate number two is the price to paint the A building, which is the newer middle school edition. The drywall and sheetrock has a very pleasing appearance. However, we are finding that the paint job is not holding up near as well or long uh, as CMU block does. It is starting to show there. That building, especially in classrooms, is starting to look worse for the wear. However, due, due to all of the aforementioned budgetary and revenue concerns, we are not recommending moving forward with add alternate number two at this time. We had three respondents to the bid to paint Riverdale. Professional painting services withdrew their bid. Sproul Construction, no bid at alternate number one, which is something that the district is recommending. This is the reason for the recommendation to award, to award the bid, including the base bid and at alternate number one to Savage Brothers. As aforementioned, this project would be funded with the GMSD general fund as it does not meet Shelby County's definition of a capital improvement project. Uh, at this point, I'll turn it back over to Ms. Luter and I'll be available if any of the board members have questions. Thank you, Mr. Manuel and Mr. Kathy. Um, is there a motion? I move to approve GMSD bid number FY 2020-11 for the Riverdale Elementary School painting project, including the base bid and add alternate number one to Savage Brothers Incorporated in the amount of $328,323. Second. The motion was made by Ms. Fisher and seconded by Ms. Landers. Is there any discussion, Ms. Fisher? No, not at this time, thank you. Ms. Landers? Nothing, thank you. Ms. Griffith? No, thank you. Ms. Oates? Um, I just want to comment if that's all right um based on the financial information we that was just shared i just want to restate what i'm understanding um so we're expecting lower funding from the county due to decreased sales tax revenue based on covid 19 and at the same time our city decided that it would be a good time to have us take on a payment to shelby county schools of uh, $355,000 and change that they've covered for six years, but now I've decided not to cover. That is correct. Yes. That is correct. That is correct. That is correct, Ms. I just wanted clarification to make sure I understood that as we see decreased operational funds coming from the county, we are also basically seeing um, an a decrease in operational funds from the city. Yes, Ms. Oak. Okay. Um, thank you. Ms. Subramani, would you please call the roll? Ms. Griffith? Yes. Ms. Olf? Yes. Ms. Fisher? Yes. Ms. Landers? Yes. Chairman Luter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. The next item on our agenda is item 8F, Dogwood Elementary School ADA project. Mr. Manuel? I'll let Mr. Kathy explain the big uh, tabulation and recommendation for this project. Yes, sir. For the Dogwood ADA bid, um, we broke this out into several sections as well. There were actually five in total, starting with the base bid, which includes anything and everything that encompasses bringing that campus uh, into ADA compliance. Uh, so that includes door hardware, it includes bathrooms, it includes slopes, it includes handrails, uh, it includes anything and everything that you can imagine that's ADA. That was a long and tedious process to identify all of the items that we could possibly identify. Uh, and put that in together. So the base bid includes all work that will bring that campus uh, into compliance with ADA. Uh, alternate bid alternate number one includes a new secure entrance, including additional office space and a conference room. Um, this will bring it to a standard with our other elementary schools that have a similar secure space when you enter the building. So that will bring all of our, our elementary schools into that standard. 
and we are recommending alternate number one in addition to the base bid. We are also recommending alternate number two, which includes all above ceiling work, uh, which will be a new sprinkler system. Dogwood does not currently have a sprinkler system. Uh, new ceiling tile and grid system, a new LED lighting system, and all other associated work above ceiling in addition to recabling for technology uh, to bring it up to standards with our other elementary schools. Uh, bid alternates number three and four, and four included a new handrail system. Uh, we did not receive pricing that we felt was favorable, and this was not as high of a priority item. So we're not recommending moving forward with bid alternates number three and four at this time. Grinder Tabor Grinder was the low bidder for this job, and they are who we are recommending to approve uh, the base bid along with bid alternates number one and two. Uh, as aforementioned, our goal is to fund this project using a combination of Shelby County Commission and City of Germantown funding that must be used for a capital improvement project. Uh, at this time, I'll turn it back over to Ms. Luter, and I'll be available if the board has any questions. Thank you, Mr. Cathy. The chair would entertain a motion. I move to approve GMSD bid number FY 2020-10 for Dogwood Elementary School ADA upgrades, including the base bid and alternates number one and number two to Grinder Tabor Grinder in the amount of $3,717,232. Second. The motion was made by Ms. Griffith and seconded by Ms. Oaf. Um, we will have discussion, Ms. Fisher. Yes, I just wanted to thank um, the superintendent, Mr. Jones, for the review of our reserves as we make a decision about spending $3 million in this time. Um, I also want to say since the beginning of the district, we have been very conservative in our expenditures. And I'm thankful that we have the reserves to start off the school year in July, as well as the extra reserves that may be need needed due to the loss of sales tax with the virus. Um, I had one quick question I forgot to ask during the work session. Um, Superintendent Manuel, I know our funding that we receive is based on student attendance. Has the Department of Ed said how they're going to handle that with us not taking attendance? Um, they have not, uh, but the only clarification they gave, they said that uh, all the funding would remain the same, uh, but they haven't gone into the specifics. So we do not uh, predict a decrease in funding uh, during this time. Ms. Fisher, any further discussion? No, I'm sorry, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Landers? No, thank you. Ms. Griffith? No, thank you. Ms. O? No, thank you. Thank you, and I do want to um, just reiterate that we are not dipping into our reserves to fund this project. These are funds that come from the county and from the city that are designated funds for capital improvement and have to be spent on capital improvement, um, the ones from the county by September. And so um, for anyone who might be confused about why we would um, move forward with these projects at this time, that is the reasoning behind it. Uh, Ms. Subramani, would you please call the roll? Ms. Ulf? Yes. Ms. Fisher? Yes. Ms. Landers? Yes. Ms. Griffith? Yes. Chad Maluter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. We move to item 8G, GMSD fiscal year 2019-20 miscellaneous budget amendments. Um, we have three budget amendments, 18, 19, and 20, um, and we will take them as a group. I um, turn it over to Mr. Manuel. Yeah, so I'll review uh, each of these budget amendments. So budget amendment number 18 uh, acts on the fact that y'all approved the um, ADA project at Dogwood. This appropriates the county commission dollars into the correct funds for this project. So that's what you see with budget amendment number 18. Number 19 uh, is an appropriation to pay for students. We have students who uh, need to uh, attend behavioral services either at Lakeside or Crestwind or Compass, and they may be there for extended periods uh, to help them get uh, the challenge, face the challenges that they have. Um, so for that 
extended care, we do provide and pay for education instruction to those agencies when we're required to do so. This budget amendment uh, provides for that funding uh, to pay for those students who are in in, in treatment facilities. Number 20. Number 20 is a, a regular occurrence for us. We do have an OPEB trust fund that uh, our board has planned to fully fund. And every year we fully fund this money. Uh, this pays for our retirees health insurance uh, once they leave us. Uh, but our retirees are housed within our other health insurance account. And so periodically through the year based on the quarters and the claims, uh, we reimburse our health insurance account with, from our OPEB trust fund. And that's what you see here in the amount of $220,000 being added to, uh, uh, to pay for our retiree medical claims. And so those are 18, 19, and 20. Ms. Luter and board, uh, I'll be glad to answer any questions that you have on these amendments. Thank you, Mr. Manuel. Is there a motion? I move to approve the GMSD fiscal year 2019-2020 miscellaneous budget amendments 18, 19, and 20. Second. It's been moved by Ms. Oath and seconded by Ms. Landers. Is there discussion, Ms. Fisher? No, not at this time, thank you. Ms. Landers? Nothing at this time. Ms. Griffith? No, not at this time, thank you. Ms. Oath? None, thank you. Ms. Subramani, would you please call the roll? Ms. Fisher? Yes. Ms. Landers? Yes. Ms. Griffith? Yes. Ms. Oath? Yes. Chairman Luter? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Item 8H is resolution for waiver of policies in COVID-19 to address the needed suspension of board policies for this time. Mr. Manuel. Yes, I think it's helpful for the board um, before we start talking about the policies that need to be waived um, to talk about the rationale uh, behind uh, these new policies for the state school board? And how is GMSD uh, trying to uh, serve all of our students and family? So first, we are a public school in the state of Tennessee. And because of that, we do have to follow the Tennessee State School Board policies. And so um, the Tennessee State School Board, in light of this pandemic, has passed a policy 05200102. And the main component of this policy is that students shall not be given an unexcused absence or reported as truant uh, of any absence during this period of school closure. So why is it important for them to say that we can't count students unexcused? Uh, Dr. Mo Sarah Morrison is the executive director of the Tennessee State School Board. And this was her explanation. She said, we felt this was a necessary clarification because many of our students statewide do not have access to reliable internet service. They may also be taking on additional roles and responsibilities in their family, such as watching younger siblings and things like that during this time when many more students are at home. So we do not want to penalize students with unexcused absences when they are unable to participate in online or instructional options. So we regularly consult the Tennessee School Board Association and Chuck Hagel, who's their attorney, We've been asking the question, so what does this mean? What does this mean for our students? It's that we should not have quarter four grades and should not record fourth quarter grades. Because of the absence policy, if a student chooses not to participate in these activities or has a challenge that they can't participate in these activities, we cannot hold them accountable. So we cannot move forward with fourth quarter grades. The reason why is a question of equity. So this is a familiar, um, drawing or a picture for a lot of educators because we often use it in reference to our special needs students. And it's really the difference between equality and equity. When you look at the students on the left, uh, all students are not created equal. Some of them have significant challenges, um, whether they're uh, special needs students or they're coming from an economically disadvantaged home where they don't have the same resources that other students do. And we don't provide them all the same resources to make them successful. If we did that, it would not be a, a fair situation. Some students would thrive in, 
you can see this example, able to see over the fence and see the game. Other students would not. So equity is different than equality. Uh, with equity, we are trying to provide extra accommodations, extra modifications, so all of our students can be successful and achieve and reach our goals for them to be successful with uh, post-secondary school or with a career. If we move forward and you see the reality picture and started moving forward with new instruction, there would be a large number of students that are, are left behind because we either couldn't provide those accommodations or they're facing new challenges. We would actually be adding more crates in this picture uh, because of the, the pandemic. So the state school board felt it important to say we are not going to um, hold these students accountable with absences because we don't know what different families are experiencing during this challenging time. So I think GMSD and, and Germantown, we pride ourselves uh, in the fact that we serve all students. In Tennessee public schools, especially in our district, all means all. And you can see this uh, in our ACT scores. We don't just look at how many students are scoring the highest scores. We want to make sure how many are scoring over that 21 on the ACT. It's a really rigorous uh, benchmark. That means we're making all students successful for uh, post-secondary uh, education. So if you can see where we started in 2016 at 74.4% scoring over 21, the fact that we've raised it to an 86.2 is because we have provided those supports. We have removed barriers that may prohibit students from being as successful. And so if you look at the federal designations of economically disadvantaged or students with disabilities or English language learners, those students who are coming in and, and they're now trying to learn English while they're trying to master our concepts or our black, Hispanic or Native American students are historically underserved uh, subgroups, we may be adding a new subgroup to this. And those are families and students that are struggling during this uh, pandemic. Either they have family members that have lost their jobs or they're taking care of siblings, like Dr. Morrison highlighted, um, or their family is, is sick. Um, these are real challenges that we have to tread lightly on and we have to make sure that we're serving all students. So what did the state school board uh, recommend and suggest that school districts do during this time? They suggested that we look at quarter three opportunities. Uh, across the state, a lot of students really work hard and, and pull up their grades in that fourth quarter. And those uh, middle school students who are taking high school credits or those high school students, that transcript goes with them. Uh, it's not necessarily the case for those students in elementary or in, in sixth and seventh grade. If they're not taking high school courses, that transcript doesn't move with those students. So the state school board was concerned that we needed to provide students an opportunity that if that quarter three grade was now going to count as their semester grade, and that is what is going to be included on their transcript and uh, important for the HOPE scholarship or uh, clearinghouse opportunities for athletes through the NCAA, that we needed to provide opportunities for students to improve their third quarter grade, so that can count as their semester grade. So they gave uh, some local authority in this case. They said that local school districts may provide remote learning uh, for those quarter three grades because we have already provided uh, that instruction. We've already provided those lessons to students. So we're going to allow Ms. Price uh, to talk about what are going to be our quarter three mastery options for our students. To <clears throat> so to follow up with what the State Board of Education put in their new rules, um, there is a school closure toolkit that's put out by Commissioner Swin, Schwinn, and it was updated on 414. And in there, she says, considerations for learning activities that are based upon content and skills already experienced by students may be the most appropriate at this time, given the anxieties that many students and adults are facing. So with that being said, we have put together our plan for a quarter three mastery options for students. And in essence, they're going to have an opportunity to raise their quarter three grade and <clears throat> in lieu of having quarter four to bring those grades up. So working with the teaching, learning and assessment department, Mr. Taylor, Ms. Abel and the PLCs or the professional learning communities at the high school. Um, we looked at how many grades are the minimum requirement for high school and is 10. So we asked them to come up with five additional learning opportunities, two of those being in-depth or heavily weighted activities, such as project, a project-based learning activity or a major test. And then three of those being supporting assignments, such as quizzes, homework, 
in that. Um, they would be supporting essential quarter three standards that are going to be most helpful for students to have a better understanding of going into next year. We also ask them to be very mindful that our students may be improving grades in more than one course. Um, our recommendation is definitely not more than an hour a day, just in case, again, students are trying to get more than one course done. We don't want to overload them. <clears throat> These um, opportunities will be available to all high school or middle school credit bearing courses. So if a middle schooler is taking geometry or algebra or physical science, physical science, they will also have this opportunity. <clears throat> we have told the teachers they can use assignments they, that were previously created either in the third quarter or currently the learning opportunities that they're being put out and that all IEP and 504 accommodations already in place must be applied to the activities. So to sum it up, the students will have the opportunity to make up five total assignments and those assignments will replace their lowest grade for that same weighted assignment in the grade book. Students cannot go down in grade. This, these grades must benefit them and improve their overall score. Um, so the Tennessee School Board of Education policy it does not allow for students in quarter three then their, their grades to decrease. Um, students will be able to take advantage of some assignments and they don't have to do all. They could choose just one major assignment if they feel like that would bump their grade from, from one level to another. And the teachers are expected to help guide students throughout the process. So what's the plan going forward? First, I'm gonna back up. Mr. Manuel and I addressed the high school teachers on Friday via Google Hangout um, and, and laid out the plan and what the expectations were um, and just let them know that we were here to help and uh, be supportive. Over the weekend, we got many questions. And so the teaching learning assessment team today did a fact sheet to put out to the teachers. Today, teachers began working with our PLCs, choosing or crafting those opportunities for students to improve their grades. Tomorrow, a survey will go out via the high school. It will go out in all of our different media outlets um, for students to either opt in or opt out of these school or these um, improvement opportunities, grade improvement opportunities. We'll be using Skyward and to make sure parents also see these advertisements. And our teachers will be using those opt-in, opt-out to make sure each student has made a choice. If we find students have not replied, then we'll be reaching out to them via our guidance counselors and the homeroom teachers, or even our team to make sure we reach each and every student. So uh, by May 4th, all teachers would, should have all five opportunities made available to the students. They can start today or tomorrow. They don't have to wait, but they have to all be available by May 4th. And all completed work must be turned back in by May 15th. This will allow teachers time to grade those assignments and get the grades changed in the grade book. So what is next for Germantown Municipal Schools? As we move forward, we will continue to provide learning opportunities through May 22nd for all of our students. Our teachers will continue offering two to three learning opportunities weekly. We will continue using the family-friendly choice boards that cover multiple areas and don't just demand screen time. We'll continue our televised lessons and we'll continue live sessions through Google Hangouts. Secondly, <clears throat> what are we going to do about those untaught standards? We have compiled a list from kindergarten all the way up through 11th grade of which standards have not been taught that we need to make sure we shore up for our students to be successful next year. And so on that, I just want to point out that our ELA standards are year long. So all year we're working on those same standards over and over and over again with different types of texts and the complexity will grow as the year goes. Um, for our K-5, the three major standards that were hit or miss were foundational literacy and that was just one or two, 
reading literacy, and then reading informational text. And with that being said, that's out of a total of 40 standards. So we're in a really good place. Math, mostly what was missed was geometry and measurement and data. And those are not major work of the grade for math. In Algebra 1, we only had two of the standards from the major work of the grade, and really they were supporting standards of the major work of the grade. So we, I feel very confident that our teachers will be able to find a way in order to make sure our students are ready for next year. Here's, here's, how, they, here's how the percentages turn out. Elementary school, we've taught 89% of our elementary standards. In middle school, we've taught 75% of the standards. And in high school, we've taught 86% of the standards. In middle school, I do want to point out that in math, mostly it was all of statistics and probability and geometry, which was what was left, which is usually what we do after testing. So, Mr. And that leads us to our, our, yeah, that leads us, I, I'll get this, that leads us to our other future steps uh, in closing out the school year. And I do want to clarify that those opportunities for students, and, and we met with high school teachers and middle school teachers who teach uh, high school courses. So it will be open to any of those students who are taking high school courses, not if you, even if you're not physically at the, at the high school. But where will we close out the year? Um, First, we are developing plans and some of the schools have started to release these for personal property pickup for staff and students. We wanna make sure that we're complying with uh, our local and state ordinances about how many individuals we can have in one place at one time. Uh, we're also looking and developing the plans for drop off of school issued materials like band uniforms, uh, computer devices uh, for seniors once they have completed uh, those Q3 opportunities. We also wanna prepare for fill facilities for summer in a safe uh, manner. So we want to make sure that we're getting ready to paint and, and do work at Dogwood and giving teachers a chance in limited numbers uh, while also making sure that they're maintaining that social distancing to shut down their classrooms. And then finally, and, and it's not the least thing that we need to worry about, uh, we want to honor all of our students. And I want our families to know uh, that we are going to do special things to recognize those students who are moving from uh, elementary school to middle school, from middle school to high school, and then of course for our seniors. Uh, we really want to do something in person, but we're looking at virtual options. We're looking at parades. We're looking at uh, things to make our students, our, our seniors experience special. So know that those will be uh, released shortly once we have a, a greater idea around uh, when we can get together safely again. So in light of all these uh, issues, we are asking the school board tonight, and this is consistent with the Tennessee School Board's uh, recommendation, for the board to pass a resolution to temporarily uh, suspend the following policies. 4.640, which is on grading, 4.605 on graduation requirements, 4.700 on testing, 5.109 on personnel evaluations, 5.611 on educator licenses, and 6.200 on attendance and truancy. With that, um, that concludes our presentation on uh, the needs uh, behind uh, these resolutions. We hope that we've uh, also highlighted the state school board's objectives about why they're uh, proceeding in such a manner and why we are recommending to move uh, to waive these policies. So Ms. Luter, I, I turn it back over to you and we are glad to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Mr. Manuel and Ms. Price. Um, is there a motion to waive these policies? I move to approve the Germantown Board of Education Resolution um, 01-2019-2020 to suspend board policies. Second. The motion was made by Ms. Oath and seconded by Ms. Fisher, I believe. Yes. Ms. Fisher, do you have any questions or discussion? Yes, just a couple of things. I want to thank the superintendent, Ms. Price, for um, covering everything about our curriculum and how everything is being done till the end of the year. Um, I know they answered a lot of questions that we all as board members have been receiving. Um, I wanted, there were two questions I had, and one, one is one I'm going to repeat from the, the work session, just in case people have not listened to the work session and the board 
meeting. Uh, Ms. Price, could you just explain again about um, equity of the opportunities because how you're gonna keep one teacher from assigning a 10 page paper versus a two page paper? Absolutely, so uh, working with the PLCs and working with Mr. Taylor and Ms. Abel, um, we're giving, we have given the teachers guidance as to where they should start. They should start with assignments that they had already given in third quarter and either change them up, reuse them, reorder them, whatever, or come up with a new comparable activity. We also guide them that the recommendation is no more than an hour per course per, per day or up to four hours per week. We let them know that students may want to take advantage of, of um, improving more than one grade and to please take that into consideration. And so um, our, to our, our teaching, learning, and assessment team working with the high school team will ensure that we're watching those Schoology pages and what those assignments look like to make sure that our students have um, have the ability to complete the assignments in a timely manner and have um, their individual needs met. Thank you. I also had one question I forgot to ask in the work session. What thought have we give, given to um, holding ESY this summer? So Ms. Huffman will be able to answer those. We know that one of the things that uh, we have to look at is whether students are gonna regress during this period of time. And we've traditionally offered extended school year for our uh, special needs students that do experience some regression. Um, once again, we are gonna have to look at uh, what is happening uh, across the state with the governor's recommendations. And when we're able to meet in groups, uh, we are developing plans next year to, to look at what will happen if, if we haven't lifted, if they haven't lifted these recommendations for sizes and, and groups of individuals. So um, with that, Ms. Huffman, if you wanna jump in and uh, mention anything about ESY, I'll turn it over to you. Sure, I feel like that typical person, I couldn't find my mute key. Um, you would think as many meetings as I've been in that I would be a professional, but apparently not. No, for ESY, uh, you know, we continued with virtual meetings that week after uh, spring break and kept business going um, to make sure we're making those decisions and looking at additional students that in light of these situations may benefit from extended school year services. So the way we're planning it as of right, as of today, um, really based on the guidance from the governor about when we can get into groups. But right now, we're moving forward with that end date. I think it's, um, sorry, May 25th, May 26th. I can't remember just off the top of my head, but we're keeping with our original dates. We're planning on uh, being at Forest Hill Elementary, Monday through Thursday, 8.30 to 12.30. But all that can change based on um, when we're able to gather in groups. So we're just being very flexible attending tons of webinars on the national and state level and looking for guidance um, from the state department and we'll be making adjust adjustments based on that. But teachers are still having those extended school year meetings and talking with families about these decisions, just really in constant contact um, about what they're doing now and then you know what it might look like this summer. So um, we're crossing fingers and toes and adjusting as we need to. Thank you, Ms. Huffman. Ms. Fisher, thank you for your questions. Ms. Landers, do you have any discussion or questions? Nothing, thank you. Ms. Griffith? No questions. I would like to thank Ms. Price um, and all the team of people that have really laid this out to explain um, thoroughly to the community the why we're doing what we're doing um, and the timetable in which we're doing it, so much of which is dictated to us, but that we've been really mindful not to, uh, you know, make really quick decisions, but to make thoughtful ones. And um, as we go over um, this resolution, I'm just, just really grateful for everybody's time and effort and um, really appealing to every student everywhere and, uh, and where they are. So thank you all again. Ms. Oath. Oh, I would like to second what Ms. Griffith said. I think she put it just right. 
Um, and thank you to, to everyone involved in, in getting this on the, up and running and um, as successful as it is. Um, I did ask a question in the work session. I'm going to repeat um, just in case someone didn't hear it then. Um, Mr. Manuel, um, are you comfortable that what we are doing is in line with other districts, not only in our area, but across the state of Tennessee? Yes, I, I would like to echo that one of the things that I think makes uh, Shelby County special is the superintendents and how we all work together. So um, Ms. Huffman's team, Ms. Price's team, they have been in coordination with the municipal uh, teams uh, that mirror them. Uh, and we are doing uh, almost the same, if, if not exactly the same uh, activities and processes in our school districts. Uh, I also serve as the head of the Southwest Corps for superintendents in the region, and they are also mirroring what we are doing. So uh, yes, to answer your question, we are all following uh, the same process, providing the same or similar opportunities for our students, not just in the Southwest Corps and in this region, but across the state. Thank you, Mr. Manuel. Um, I also wanna thank um, you and your team for being so mindful that um, the decisions we're making and y'all are making regarding the academic needs of our kids is, um, is also a part of who are the whole child that our children are and, and keeping in mind that, these, that our students are in a stressed situation um, just like all of our parents are and um, the flexibility and mindfulness to that has been evident and I truly appreciate that. Thank you. There being no further discussion, Ms. Subramani, will you please call the roll? Ms. Landers? Yes. Ms. Griffith? Yes. Ms. Ulf? Yes. Ms. Fisher? Yes. Chairman Luther? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries. This concludes the business this meeting was called. I have two items for announcements. The first is that the next GMSD school board meeting is May 18, 30 p.m. And the second is that if you have not already, um, GMSD has a website. It is called gmsdk12.org. And there at the top, you will see in black, and white GMSD distance learning and pandemic updates. Click here for information and resources. When you click there, you will be taken to GMSD at home educational opportunities. And I encourage everyone to go there and to explore your age child's resources um, and, and really dig into what's available for your children academically, but also from counselors um, and to consider your own child and your own child's needs individually. Every child you have, if you have three children, don't treat them the same. Um, each of us are experiencing this time in a unique way. And for some, schedules are very comforting and important, and for others, they are not right now. Um, for some, academics are very comforting and important, and for others, they are not right now. And so please, Take the time to sit down with your family and with your children individually to talk with them and also to individualize what they need and reach out to us as well um, if we can be helpful in individualizing that. Um, but again, there are amazing educational opportunities there at GMSD at home and we are utilizing them in my household and are very appreciative and thankful for them. And I want to thank Mr. Manuel and Ms. Price and Ms. Huffman and all of your teams for all that you are doing in this time. With that, we stand adjourned.